Adding a Raspberry Pi to your existing Kubernetes cluster is a lot easier than you think. I went into this thinking it was going to be really hard. I thought I was going to have to point all of my Raspberry Pi nodes at an ARM version of a container image. Or at least I thought I was going to have to do something different or put in a lot of hacks. But I only had to do a few things different and zero hacks to get this working. It all starts with choosing the right Raspberry Pi. You'll want a Pi 4, plain and simple. This is a quad-core CPU, ARM V8, 64-bit, and clocked at 1.5 gigahertz. You'll get gigabit ethernet, although wireless will work too. You'll also get some USB ports and some micro HDMI ports, but those really aren't important for running Kubernetes. You do have one choice though, of RAM. I chose the model with 8 gigabytes because, well, I'm running Kubernetes and some workloads. Then you'll have to choose a micro SD card. The OS isn't going to take up that much and you can probably get by with 32 gigs, but I go with 64 for all of your container images and it's only a couple dollars more. Another choice is power over ethernet. Now, this is totally up to you, but I chose power over ethernet so that I can supply power to my Raspberry Pi over my ethernet connection. I went with this option because I don't have to have any additional cords. I get power and ethernet in one plug. And this specific hat includes a CPU fan, which keeps my CPU cool. And all of my networking is on a separate UPS so that if the power goes out, all of my PoE devices still get power, including this Raspberry Pi. So after you get all the parts, you'll have to put it together. Fortunately, I got some help on my live stream with this. I went into this not knowing how it was going to turn out, but it actually turned out really great. I unboxed and assembled the Pi quickly with your help. But it wasn't until the end that I realized that I bought the wrong PoE hat, which would have been fine, but it didn't fit in the case that I bought. Oh well, at least the PoE worked. I ended up getting the correct hat and assembling it, and it fits together perfectly now. And I have links to all of this in the description below if you're curious. The next step after the physical build is then installing the operating system. Now, you have a few options for operating systems on your Raspberry Pi, but the Raspberry Pi Manager has you covered. I choose Ubuntu 64-bit LTS for this node in my Kubernetes cluster, and that's because I'm running an Ubuntu server on all of my K3S nodes within my cluster. The choice is really up to you, and you don't have to match your OSs, but I am for management. So here, we're going to choose our operating system, then we're going to choose other generic purpose OS, then we'll choose Ubuntu here, then I chose the LTS version of Ubuntu 64-bit. Then you'll choose the SD card, and then you'll flash your image. After it's flashed, you'll pop it in your Raspberry Pi, boot it up, configure a few things like SSH and passwords, and all the typical things you do for new servers or Raspberry Pis. Then you'll want to be sure that you can SSH into that device. And once you can, we'll start to install and configure K3S. But first, you'll need to decide what type of node this is. And whenever I say node, I just mean a server. So is it going to be an API server? Now, what is a K3S API server? A K3S API server is responsible for Kubernetes control plane and API actions. This is only meant to run critical tasks for Kubernetes. And typically, you don't want any of your user workloads running here. And so when I say workloads, I mean containers like Plex, Minecraft or Nextcloud. And so an API server typically won't run those workloads. It will be the server that we connect to when we issue kube control commands. Which brings me to the next type, which is agents. And so the primary responsibility of a K3S agent is just to run user workloads. These are the workloads that I mentioned before, but K3S agents are primarily responsible for running those. So why not both? This is a great question and it's going to be up to you. So I typically like separation of concerns so that my API servers are only responsible for Kubernetes actions and my agents are only responsible for user workloads. And this is how I'm going to configure it, but it's really up to you. So in order to join any new server to our cluster, we'll need to get our existing token. And to get our token, you'll want to SSH into one of your K3S servers. So after you SSH in, we're going to do a couple of things. First, let's check our K3S version. Then we'll want to run K3S dash dash version. This will give us the version of K3S. So make note of this. Then we'll want to run this command right here, which will be in the documentation, but it's a command to get our token. You'll also want to make note of this too. Then we'll close out of our SSH session for that server with exit. Then we'll SSH into our new Pi. The first thing we'll want to do is set a variable for our K3S version. This ensures that we're installing the same version of K3S as our cluster is running. Then you'll want to run this curl command. So this curl command is the same command you use to join other agents to your cluster. 
And it's a combination of URL for your servers, if you're using a load balancer, you would point it there, some permissions for a kube control, and your K3S token. And after running that command, you should see some status and some info messages being printed out. So now let's check to see if it joined our cluster. So let's disconnect from this SSH session. And then from our local machine, we'll run kube control get nodes. And we can see here my new node called Elio, that's my Raspberry Pi, has joined the cluster, but it's not ready yet. Now this might take some additional time, so be patient. It has to install and configure Kubernetes and pull down additional containers depending on how Kubernetes is configured. And eventually, your agent will join the cluster. So now let's check to see if we have any pods running on that new agent. We can do this by running kube control, get pods, all namespaces, oy, field selector, spec, node name, Elio. And this last piece is the name of your node. And if we run that, we can see some pods are running. So right now it's pulling down pods that my Kubernetes cluster needs on every node. You can see I'm running Longhorn and you can see I'm running some monitoring, which we'll talk about in a later video. But it's pulling all these pods down and creating these containers. And eventually it'll pull down all that it needs for Kubernetes to run. And so congratulations. You now have a multi-architecture Kubernetes cluster. You have a cluster that can run on ARM64, as well as your x86 or x64 processors. And this is super cool. But where it gets really cool is adding our own workloads now. And so how does it know how to pull down the right container image for this processor type for an ARM64 processor? Well, most major container image maintainers have already done this work for you. During their CI pipeline, they're building x86 and x64, ARM32 and ARM64. So they've already done the hard work for you. And so there's almost absolutely nothing to do because when Kubernetes requests that image, it can request it per processor type. And so you don't need to worry about referencing ARM64, ARM32, x86, and all of your images. Kubernetes will handle that for you. Does this sound too good to be true? Let's give it a shot. And so normally you would just let Kubernetes be Kubernetes and let the scheduler schedule your pods on any of your nodes. This new node that we just spin up on a Raspberry Pi is ready and available to take on pods. So if the scheduler decides right now it wants to deploy one of my pods to this new Raspberry Pi, it will. But rather than waiting for Kubernetes to do it for us, we can actually force this to. And so what we wanna do is assign pods to a specific node. And there are a couple ways to do it, but we'll take the easy way. We're gonna use a combination of node selector and Kubernetes labels. This gives us the ability to label our node and then tell our pods when they get scheduled that they should only be scheduled on nodes with that label. And it's really easy. Let's do that real quick. So if we run kube control, get nodes, show labels, it's going to show all the labels of all of my nodes. And if we find Elio in this list, there really isn't anything interesting. So let's add a label to Elio so that we can use node selector to deploy pods specifically to that node. And so the way we're gonna do this is run kube control label nodes Elio, and then we're gonna set a key value pair. Now this is free form, it's whatever you want and however you wanna label your node. You could do something like disk type equals micro SD or something like CPU type equals ARM or your own label like PoE powered equals true. And this is free form and you could use whatever you'd like, but it's just an indicator so we can use node selector to deploy pods specifically to this node. And so I'm gonna use CPU type equals ARM64. And so now we apply that label to that node and then we can use kube control describe node Elio. After we run that command and we scroll up, we can see our labels. So for my node, Elio, it now has a label called CPU type equals ARM64. And again, this can be anything you want it to be, but just remember what it is. And now that we have that label, we can schedule a pod specifically to this node. So let's create a pod spec really quick for our pod. So this pod spec is gonna look like any other pod spec. It's pretty simple, it's just an Nginx container, but we've actually added our node selector now. So our node selector, you can see that it's going to use the label we created and assigned to that node, which is CPU type, it's ARM64. And so let's save this pod spec and then we'll run kube control create dash f for a file nginx dash pod dot yaml. That's the file we just created. And after running that command, 
We can run Coop Control again and look at the pod specifically on that node, and here we see our Nginx pod. And so this pod will only run on this node because it matches that label. And you can do this for any of your nodes, but this was just an example of how to force it on a new Raspberry Pi. And another cool thing, if you're running Rancher, you can see this node with the label in the nodes section. And we can easily modify and change it here too, but I wanted to show you with plain old Kubernetes. And if we find that workload, we can see here, it's Nginx and it's running on our new node called Elio. And from here, we can exec into it and do all the normal things we could. And so that's how easy it is to join a Raspberry Pi to your existing Kubernetes cluster. After doing this, you have a multi-architecture Kubernetes cluster that's capable of running ARM workloads as well as x86 workloads. And you can use something like this if you have workloads that are specific for ARM, or if you wanna fall back to a low power device if your servers go down, which might be coming in the future. And so do you see yourself using a Raspberry Pi in your Kubernetes cluster? Are you already running one in your Kubernetes cluster? If so, let me know in the comments below. And if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. So uh, this is probably not gonna work. Should work. I don't know why it wouldn't, but things usually don't work for me on the first time. Um, but the idea is, oh yeah, when you plug it in, yeah, uh, you get ethernet and you get power. Yeah, I got it. So, so Lil Wario, that's, that's the cool thing about PoE or power over ethernet is that when you um, plug it into devices um, that, that support PoE, you can give them power and network in one. So this guy's up and running and he's, he's kicking off some air.